Hi, John from Insta Cluster here. I'm really excited to be talking to you today at Community Overcode. I'm really sorry I couldn't be there in person, but I hope you find this video to be really interesting and insightful. It's a really interesting use case that we had in Insta Cluster around our Apache Cassandra cluster that we use internally, and how we went about reducing our storage usage of our Apache Cassandra cluster just by tweaking a few things in our schema. All right, so what are we going to talk about today? First of all, we're going to talk about how InstaCluster uses Apache Cassandra and how it fits into our use case um, for our metric processing pipeline. We're going to talk a little bit about how we went about analyzing our Cassandra storage, understanding what was taking up a lot of space, and figuring out some of the ways we might be able to ameliorate that. We're going to go a bit deeper dive into the schema of our Instametrics cluster, of our Apache Cassandra cluster, and what makes the data the way it is and why it was chosen to be that way. And then the last thing we're going to do is we're going to have a look at how we went about making the change. And then we're going to dive into some graphs and some details about what the res resolution of these changes were and how it really um, impacted our, Insta our um, Apache Cassandra cluster uh, and made the changes that we wanted. First of all, let's talk about how InstaCluster uses Apache Cassandra. Now, InstaCluster is a managed service offering. So we will provide you an Apache Cassandra cluster, an Apache Kafka cluster, and a number of other open source technologies as a managed service. And as part of that managed service fleet, we currently have over 1,300 clusters under our management, and that comprises of more than 10,000 nodes or servers that are in our managed service offering. As part of that managed service offering, each of these nodes regularly reports metrics back to our central processing pipeline. These metrics are used internally by our automated tools, which raises alerts and warnings, and generally advises our technical operations team of the health of every node and cluster under our management system. Now this metrics processing pipeline processes over 2 million records a second. So 2 million events come in every second, and we calculate rules, SLAs, warnings, as I mentioned. It raises alerts via PagerDuty and Datadog, and it also aggregates and rolls up metrics for long-term storage. At the end of the day, all of these metrics, as they're being processed, are eventually stored in an Apache Cassandra cluster that we call internally Instametrics. And that's what we're going to talk to you about today. So let's talk about quickly how what Inst how Intermetrics has changed over the years. So this is our Apache Cassandra cluster. So it was originally provisioned actually in Apache Cassandra 2. And over the years, it was been upgraded to 3, and now it's running on 404. Over time, the size has varied. So obviously when we first provisioned it, we had very few clusters under our management, and it was very small cluster size, until it reached its peak about a year and a half ago, where it was over 120 um, CPU and storage dense node sizes in AWS. That was at our peak when we had the most amount of processing on that cluster that needed that storage and those, that capability. As of today, it's 72 nodes of i3EN2X large in AWS. Instametrics has lived virtually the entire duration of InstaCluster. It's gone through a number of different iterations, but as of today, it runs on the InstaCluster managed service. So how does that work? The engineering team at InstaCluster is the customer and it's managed as it would be any other customer cluster by the technical operations team and it's backed by automated tools and systems which help them to manage this cluster. So as new nodes come online, we have to store all the new in metrics that are coming in. And that requires us to grow the size of our Apache Cassandra cluster, normally just by adding some nodes with some dense storage requirements, which allows us to buffer for the next set of um, growth that we will experience in the fleet. And there's one of these occasions that we're going to talk about today where we hit the threshold where we needed some more space. And it was at that point that our technical operations team, our Cassandra experts in that team, decided to have a close inspection of what is actually taking up so much space in the storage of this Instametrics cluster? And they did some investigation and what they found out was quite interesting and how we went about um, resolving that issue is what we're gonna talk about today. So let's talk a little bit about how we went about analyzing the storage, the disk space that was being used by Cassandra. 
So why do we go about this task in the first place? Why do we need to reanalyze our storage requirements? So in the past, as I mentioned with previous iterations of our Cassandra cluster, it had a different set of requirements. We had a lot of stuff running on it that necessitated us to prioritize CPU load, specifically Cassandra read write latencies. If those things raised too high, it had down, downstream effects on our systems that was um, negative. So we needed to prioritize the ability to keep that CPU load low and those latencies low. As I mentioned, once we removed those things that were contending for the CPU, including the removal of Spark and the introduction of Redis, suddenly the CPU load was no longer a concern. It was always at a level that was um, ensuring that the performance of our system was at its peak. So as time changed, our priorities were able to change. So it was at the latest point in time that we were able to determine that, well, the CPU load is at a level that we're happy with. So let's have a look at what is taking up so much storage and if there's any optimizations that we can make. So as we able to take the time and do some analysis. So what did they do? So as I mentioned before, this Apache Cassandra cluster is running in our managed service, but there is one key difference that this cluster is compared to um, all of the other customer clusters and that as our tech ops is allowed to actually go in and do some deep dives into the data itself. And, on one of, and when they did that, they had a look at the, one of the larger SS tables in our storage and they immediately discovered something that stood out, which was the partition index was over 50% of the size of the data file itself. So in this example that I have here, we had a 13 gigabyte data file and a nine and a half gigabyte index file. Clearly there was uh, something going on, but we weren't really sure what the problem was. And as they looked at all the other SS tables for, for other tables that were very similar in schema, they saw a repeating pattern. The index file, the partition index was incredibly large compared to the data itself. So again, as part of this analysis, what did tech ops do? What did our Cassandra experts do? They took a deep dive and had a look at the index file. And here's what it looked like. You don't have to look too closely at this. I'm gonna break it down in subsequent slides. But essentially, even from this view, you can sort of see the dichotomy of, we have a bunch of strings that are in plain text, uncompressed, obviously, you can read them, you can read the text that's on them mixed in with some compressed fields that you can't actually read. And this is exactly what we determined to be part of the problem. And what we're gonna do now is dive into sort of how that came about. So let's look at the instametric schema, which causes the partition index to look like that. The instametric schema has kind of stood the test of time. It has been largely unchanged until recently. And that's what we're going to talk about today. And how does someone design a schema for an Apache Cassandra cluster? Well, there's basically balance, needs to be balanced across two kind of dimensions, two broad dimensions. First of all, we need data partitions that are small enough that we can scale and move them around with the growth of the cluster. So if the partition key is too broad, the data all falls into a small number of partitions. And at some point, the number of partitions will be less than the number of available nodes and we can no longer scale and move the data around. We have a problem with scaling. The other thing that you need to balance that with is minimizing the number of partitions read per request because the more partitions you read in a um, select statement, the slower the performance is and you wanna keep that performance to be as optimal as possible. So these two things are in contest with each other to a certain degree. And on the right hand side, you can see an excerpt of the schema that we used for our Instametrics cluster. And I won't go too deep, i dive into it. I'm going to take a little look in a second at the primary key, which is what we're mainly interested in. But essentially, there's a number of fields um, which are storing the host, the bucket time, metric name, and some other information. But if we look at, a little bit closer here at the primary key, well, we're going to blow that up and have a quick look at exactly what that's made of. As we know, the primary key in an Apache Cassandra table is comprised of the partition key, which is in the first set of brackets, and the clustering key. And the partition key directly informs what will show up in the partition index. And so what does that look like in the table? Here is an example of a, of a row of data. I tried to make it as big as possible, so I hope you can read that okay. 
you can see the data itself is a host, bucket time, and the service time, the metric and the state. Now the things you want to, the first three columns there are the fields that make up the partition key. And I think you can already see a pattern here where we have some long text values, string values that are comprised of the partition key. So the schema impact on the partition key, we can start to unravel a little bit here, which is on the left-hand side, we can see in our table, the host, which um, as I mentioned, is a node or a node ID, and it's basically just a un unique identifier. And that's stored as a string. We have the bucket time, which is a timestamp. And then we have the service name, which is also the metric name. And this string um, is very long. It can be very long. It can be as short as just the CPU um, processor time, but it can be extremely long. Um, if you're talking about the individual Kafka consumer groups by name, by group, then the metrics that attach to it, these metrics names can be extremely long. And that varies depending on the type of application that's installed and all, a number of different tables you have and a whole bunch of different values. So what does that actually look like in the partition index? If we have a look here, I'm going to break down the various stages that we're going to go through. So the very first entry in the partition index for a single row, a single partition, is the UUID. And you can see that is a completely uncompressible string. We have now a timestamp which has been compressed away and is um, as short as it can be. And then finally we have something like a Kafka schema registry metric. And that is probably in the medium size of how long metrics names can be. And these are the three values that are repeated for every partition. And in the index for our schema, these are repeated thousands of times on every node. The partitions that we have are extremely small, and they're, which means that for every metric, there is a partition. And for every node, there are thousands of metrics. So you can see even spread across 72 nodes, uh, each node is responsible for thousands and thousands of partitions. And that means that they all end up in a partition index. So we know what the problem is now. So what do we actually do? What did our technical operations team, what did our Cassandra experts recommend that we do? Well, they analyzed the partition index and they could clearly see the problem. But the solution, we just needed to understand if it was going to solve all the problems um, that we had and not introduce any new ones. So what did they recommend? They recommended that we move the service or the metric name outside of the partition key. It's now part of the clustering key, but the partition key is limited to the host and the bucket time. So what that actually means is each partition grows significantly larger. In the old schema, a partition was at most 15 records. You can see very, very small. And in the new schema, it could vary between 30 to 75,000 rows, depending on the number of metrics a host generated. But in the scheme of things, we didn't lose too much of the partition itself because these metrics, the partitions are now keyed to host and bucket time, and the bucket time rotates every five minutes. So across 10,000 hosts, we are able to and every five minutes they change. So the partitions themselves aren't going to be extremely large. They will gradually um, time themselves out and then move to another partition, which can then be shared across um, additional nodes. So we haven't lost too much in the partition side of things, but we've gained um, in the increasing the overall partition size. So to, how did that affect all of the downstream applications that read and write metrics? Well, the analysis showed that most of the time for our customers, they're retrieving metrics for a single instance all at once anyway. So the fact that we were individually reading them out of a single partition and then concatenating them was actually reducing our performance in most cases. And our automated systems did similar things. So we weren't actually going to lose any performance by increasing the partition size. The use case had changed, which means that our schema could change with it. So just to recap before we move on to the final stage, we have an Apache Cassandra cluster that has changed over time. We've analyzed our use cases sort of in the past and as of today, and we've made a recommendation to change the partition key. But first of all, we actually have to make that change. So how do we go about doing that? 
Well, first of all, we had to make a switch. So what we did is we tested the new schema in our engineering test um, pre-production environment that all showed as being optimal. We simulated some production load. It's very difficult, as you know, to simulate a real production load, but we were happy that the tolerance that we were seeing in the performance was well within the bounds that we saw. So what do we do? We made the changes. We added the new schema into our production database. And this allowed us to stage everything and have it ready to go. And then at a designated time, we scheduled a cutover. So we introduced some code into our metrics pipeline that said, as of this date, you're going to start writing to the new schema. And we can have a very clean separation. Um, and all of the systems downstream was also following that same logic. So we made the cutover. And then all we had to do was wait for these for the data to be loaded in. And then to actually see some real differences, we needed to wait for the first set of TTLs to start triggering and compacting away. That was around 14 days. But let's have a look at what that looked like. We're gonna look at graphs now. And here's a graph. Um, doesn't look that amazing, but you have to understand that this is across 70 nodes. So we obviously use Grafana in our um, backend to monitor the various metrics that we collect. You can see here, on average, we had our clusters, were, our nodes were running around 65 to 70% full of um, storage. And after around 14 days for the initial set of TTLs to expire, not all of them, but the bulk majority of them, that reduced down to you know, under 50% for almost all the nodes um, reduced their storage to under 50%, you know, some approaching almost 40%. And you can see that is a massive benefit. On average, that's about 25 to 30% just there on the main tables, uh, which is a huge gain over 14 days worth of storage space. And in actual terms, in terms of data, you can see in the bottom graph there, there's an average of around three gig, three, sorry, three terabytes of data, which went to an average of just, uh, just under 2.2 terabytes. Really big change in not much time. And remember all we did was change the schema. We haven't changed anything else about the cluster, still the same number of nodes, still the same amount of metrics coming in. We did, it was just changed to a new schema. So what else did we see? Now this is where it gets kind of interesting. The storage space, we were really happy with. We analyzed the index. We saw a massive improvement in size and we'll get to that in a second. But there are actually some other downstream effects that we weren't fully anticipating, but we were really happy to see. You can see the read and write latencies of our Cassandra cluster improved. And a lot of that is down to what we'll see in the next slide is an improvement in CPU usage, an improvement in the cache keys being hit more often. Um, but we're really happy with the effect that the schema changes had on the performance of the cluster. Here's the CPU usage I was mentioning. At first, we weren't fully aware of what was the cause of the CPUs. We um, theorized that because there are less partitions being created on average, that was taking less time for our Cassandra cluster to operate over them. Additionally, you can see the garbage collection time has also improved, all because we've just changed the schema from having a lot of micro partitions to larger partitions that are still manageable by, the, by Cassandra. So now if we look at individual table, an old schema on the left, new schema on the right, we can see some pretty stark com comparisons there. The partition size on the old schema was around 500 bytes. So that sort of tracks with about, you know, maximum of 15 records per partition. Whereas in the new schema, that's blown up. It's almost three megs, still well within the bounds that we consider to be optimal for Apache Cassandra. So three megs is still not a massive partition and it's something that we could easily share across a number of different nodes but you can see the massive change in size as, as shown just how much data has been collated into one partition. And this is where it gets really interesting again is we can see that the old schema had a very low key, key cache hit rate. Now, this makes a lot of sense because each time you access an, a metric, that value will be stored in the key cache, but because you're operating across so many thousands of different metrics at every sort of second, that key cache is going to be pretty stale pretty quickly. It's going to hit the memory limit and then be removed. And then a new key will come in. It's very unlikely that two subsequent requests will request the exact same metric. So the key cache hit rate is very, very low. 
Whereas in the new schema, it's much higher. And we think this is the bulk of the reason why our CPU usage has gone down. The partitions are much, much larger. It's easier to cache the values with them um, and they'll, they'll live a lot longer. So if we request all of the metrics for a certain node at a certain time, and then another system requests that same metrics, the same set of metrics, the key cache is going to immediately be able to return and take advantage of the speed and reduce the CPU load. And then we'll have a, just another um, analysis of an individual's tables storage. You can see it's moved from 1.5 terabytes to about 500 gigabytes. So in this particular example, it's almost three times smaller um, or 33% of the size. Um, and that's a massive gain. Now keep in mind, this is just one of the tables over the broader Instametrics cluster, the change isn't quite as drastic. So just wrapping up, the main idea, the, the main goal was to reduce our storage cost and the storage size of the indexes and stuff. And we absolutely achieved that. You can see on the left-hand side, we had that 13 gigabit, gigabytes of data, nine and a half gigabytes of index, which was 22 gigs. And this is for the same, for a six hour window of, of data. And in the new schema, we had a 7.7 .7 gigabytes of data and a 230 meg index. Massive, massive difference. So for this particular table, that's almost 65%. Another interesting thing is you can see that the data is also smaller. Now, this would, we absolutely weren't expecting um, when we were making the change. And our Apache Cassandra experts, they theorized, we're not entirely sure why the data is smaller, but we just think that there's just less metadata, it's less uh, partition indexes, less partitions. There's less data that Apache Cassandra has to store about the individual partitions. And that means that this data file itself is much smaller. So another benefit of making such a small change has been seen across the table for this particular table. Which brings us sort of to the end game of what's going to happen in the coming months for our Cassandra cluster. Um, as of today, most of that older data has now been compacted away. So we're seeing the major benefits of the storage being um, felt already in our Cassandra cluster. Um, over a sort of a longer period of time, the longer TTLs will also feel that achievement. And we estimate, we're pretty sure over the duration of all of the TTLs and all of the tables, the total disk savings will be around 30%. Now, remember that's 30% across 70 nodes um, it's a pretty massive saving and we're really happy with the result. And in the future, what we can do is take advantage of these savings and downsize the cluster potentially. We can either move to less storage dense sizes and we could actually possibly reduce also the CPU cost of these instances. But at the very least, we can save on infrastructure costs by moving to smaller instance sizes. And all of this was driven purely out of just changing one of the partition keys in our, in our tables. Pretty massive change and we're really happy with the result, we're really happy with what we learn along the way. So that's, we're about to wrap up here. I really hope you found that a little bit interesting and um, it's a real use case that we had in our Apache Cassandra cluster. So some thoughts to take away from this um, seminar is large number of partitions combined with uncompressible partition keys can make the index uh, super long, super large. Um, so one thing you can think about going back to your Apache Cassandra distribution um, and having a look at the schema that you have and seeing if then maybe there is, a, you could potentially identify similar issues with your schema or maybe there's something, there's nothing wrong with it and go on your merry way, well done. Um, but that sort of goes hand in hand with the requirements and use cases change over time. No matter how often you deploy application servers, databases, whatever, you should always reanalyze and just make sure that as of today, if you're using that in the most optimal way. And then the final thing is making sure that you understand the usage, your pattern of usage for your Apache Cassandra cluster. That should go directly to determining the um, schema design that you determine that you design for your Apache Cassandra cluster. And it will make sure that you have the optimal settings. Um, that make sure that you're, you're taking full advantage of Cassandra and not do anything that you shouldn't be. So I wanted to say a huge thank you to Community Overcode for having me, letting me present. Um,
Unfortunately, as I mentioned, I'm not at the conference. I really wish I could be there. If you would like to reach out to me and talk about any of the things I talked about, or if you want to talk about Cassandra or Kafka or anything else, you can contact me online via my email address and you can find me on LinkedIn as well. If you'd like to talk to someone in person at the event, my colleague, you can see his photo on the left here, Paul Brebner is actually at the show. So if you run into him either at our booth or on the show floor, be sure you can talk to him about InstaCluster, Apache Cassandra, Kafka, anything you can think of and get a conversation going. Again, really great to be here. Really happy to have this presentation. I hope you found it interesting and we'll see you later. Thanks so much.